Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Scott Stedman Podcast. I am here with my co-host, Micah Current. Micah, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Is it hot over there? It seems like it's you're sweating or you look hot over there. I'm cool as a cucumber. My wife uh, doesn't turn the thermostat above 72. <laughs> oh, well, then or maybe... turn the air off, as we were talking about last week. Or may- maybe that's it. You're freezing. <laughs> You're freezing, and I'm like kind of in a mild temperature. It's not as hot as well. You said in Virginia today, it's it's kind of mild today. It's like only 74 so far. I mean, it may get hotter, but we had a lot of rain the last couple of days, which is funny. We had our Augusta County Fair uh, this past week, and anytime when the fair we have our fair, it rains, which is good because it was kind of nice, cool weather all week. So we're hoping that stays keep in mind. Keep in mind, it's still August, and I just looked at the weather here this morning, and uh, it's just been in the 90s again all week, like the mid, mid-90s mid all week, so it's going to be hot. Oh, wow. Jeez. So it's yeah. probably coming for Virginia, but you're coming to Ohio, so... Yeah, so I'm, I'm moving towards the heat. <laughs> you're you're going to drive right into it. Yeah, no joke. So uh, today's topic, we're going to talk about probably one of the most um, things that I either are neglected or the things that bring more frustration to both church leadership and even to uh, church congregants, and that is communication, church communication. Um, It seems like most of the time when I talk to pastors or I talk to church leaders or even sometimes the church members, it seems like there's always seems to be an issue of communication, whether people not knowing what to do or not knowing about certain events that are happening, or sometimes pastors' frustrations of communicating a series or an event, need people to sign up, and then it's the week of and no one signs up, and then they cancel it and people go, oh, why'd you cancel it? I was planning on coming. It's like, well, no one signed up. So a lot of frustration with communication. So, Michael, what has been your experience with uh, church communication? You've been you've been a, a worship leader at a couple of uh, different churches in different states. So, yeah, um, it's it's interesting. Uh, and I was going to ask you, you know, we can get into this in a few minutes, but like, you know, your perspective on being a senior pastor and how you communicate things to people, and if it's if it's the same feeling on the other side, being the leader versus uh, being an mm-hmm. associate or being a volunteer or being a layperson, um, or you know, people that just come into the church and want to know what's going on, um, my experience uh, has been, you know, it's it's been either side really. Like I've been in, you know several different types of churches. And as you said, Scott, I've been in a couple of different states, but um, it's, it's interesting to see how mid to larger size churches do communication versus smaller churches. And a lot of times smaller churches think that their way of communicating is good or they're communicating things well. And in my opinion, it's not. And sometimes it's not communicated at all, or those people don't yeah. communicate with everybody. They just communicate with certain people. And then like that information is filtered down. Uh, you know, you're getting like third and fourth party information, right? Do you remember the game, mm-hmm. uh, the telephone game, like you oh, yeah. in the circle, right? And you would tell somebody and like you would start. And by the time you got back around the circle, it would be completely different than what it originally, uh, what it had originally been said in the original, um, the the original sentence that was given in the the first round of that that game so like a lot of times i feel that in smaller churches that this is the case where if pastor tells somebody hey we're having a a love offering for example uh, for the victims of, of of hurricane whatever uh the rest of the church may not know because that, or, you know, other staff members in that church may not know until, you know, it's filtered down through the, through the church and through the grapevine. Um, but in my experience in mid to larger sizes, mid to larger sized churches, it's completely opposite. Like we over communicate, we over market, we over uh, promote. And uh, 
So when anybody comes up to you and asks you a question, um, you can give them the days, the time, the location. You're putting it on social media. You know, some churches have various platforms, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, like a uh, website, app, you know, video announcements during church, uh, your weekly bulletin, if you have a bulletin, your newsletter, uh, stuff out at your welcome center, you know, cards, save the dates, like churches that over communicate things. Like, I feel like the attendance are going to be, it's going to be better attended because you're over communicating. Whereas in a smaller situation, only a few people know, and it's not getting promoted. Well, what, what was your experience like being on the other side of, uh, of that coin? Because I mean, you've been on both sides, but like specifically like being the lead pastor and do you feel like you over communicated things or uh, so yeah so when I, when I was in Ohio when I would communicate announcements and stuff and things that was going on um obviously there'd be certain things that I communicate and it seemed like people knew what was going on like there was never any doubt and really the communications was they, we had a church bulletin so if it was printed in the bulletin so they had that it was on the slides before worship service so they had that information and then it was audibly communicated from the stage before we even start a worship service. Here are your announcements, and there you go. So at least there's kind of like that three-point attack where people have knowledge of what's happening in the church. Um, and that was fine. When I went to Virginia, they had kind of the same thing. Things were in a bulletin. Things were on the slides. Uh, there was email sent out uh, that was like there's weekly email sent out on. Here's all the events that are happening in the church. Here's some like a events. like a MailChimp or like a like MailChimp. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it was communicated. And sometimes if it was especially if it was an event that was coming up like a big event, it was communicated at the beginning of service. And then it was communicated at the end of service before the benediction. Mm -hmm. So it was like five or six sources of communication. Yeah. And it just seemed like the the one, the church in Virginia having so many different outlets for announcing things, it seemed like we didn't have a lot of participation unless it was something that a certain demographic group really wanted to do. Uh, so for an example, like you could promote, hey, we're doing a new Bible study on the book of Revelation or on the book of Joshua. Or the, or the book of Jonah, and you could really say, okay, new series, we're going to do this, coming out, it's going to be great. It's going to be one for to answer any of your questions about whatever. Okay. And maybe, you know, you get your core group of, you may get like your main core group of five or six people that come to a Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, and then maybe you might get a couple more that may tack on. Um, and that's okay. But if you say, hey, we're having our senior luncheon, uh, this set this this Wednesday, we're having a senior luncheon. We're going to have a quartet group sing. We're going to have burgers and fries and all this stuff. Then you're probably going to have a lot more people coming because you know most people. And I don't want. And I'm not. You know, there might be some things where you know older. I think older people love, especially older church members. They love to gather together and they love to do fellowship together. So when you do something like, hey, we're putting on a dinner and a show for you. They'll go to that if you say, hey, we want to go and get in the Bible at seven o'clock. Well, they may not come because, A, not because they don't are not interested in the Bible, but it could be my eyesight's bad. I can only drive in the day. So having a seven o'clock Bible study is not going to work for me because my eyesight's not that great. So I'm not going to be driving out there. So, it, so it's like one of those things where even when you like you said, talk about over communicating, I think sometimes you can over communicate stuff to the point where people go, okay. I know this event's coming and because it's so over communicated, you, you think, well, I'm eventually going to do it because they talk about it all the time. And then you don't because you just get so caught up in all the other things that's going on with your life that are taking precedent over, like, you know, taking the kids to the dentist office or whatnot. So, yeah, I feel like less is more in some ways. Mm hmm. I feel like less is more when it comes to communication, which I think is the opposite because people just want to continue to say, hey, we're having this event, we're having this event, we're having this event. 
And I think a lot of times when you're doing that, it just becomes white noise because it's just so much and overstimulation that you just kind of tune it out. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. But at the same time, you're always going to get somebody that says, well, I didn't see it. Why wasn't it on the website or why wasn't it on you know yeah. social media or why wasn't it here? You know, why wasn't it here? Or, you know, can we make sure we put it there and, you know, people, and, and that's a whole separate conversation. People will be picky, and picky. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, me doing creative arts and, and social media and things like that in churches, I've always made sure that we've, we've promoted it and do our due diligence and respect yeah. to that. Um, like in reference to video announcements, the last two churches I've worked at, we've done video announcements and they worked fairly well for what they were. Um, mm -hmm. We branded them, named them. Um, according to the church's mission and you know the colors and the fonts and all that stuff. Uh, one of the things that I learned uh, was that we really hit three major things every time we did video announcements, and then we would include any special announcements outside of that. So like we would promote small groups, we'd promote giving, and we would promote, um, was it prayer giving? And social media we would cover those three things follow mm -hmm. us on social you can give online you can give on our app you can give in person here's the ways you can give and then um small groups so like if if nothing else was promoted each week during our video announcements we would promote those three things and then if there was a special event coming up we would we would hit that as well or we would do those three things the video announcements would play we would do you know the worship set do the welcome two songs have a time of video announcements the video announcements wrapped and then a pa the host pastor would get up and you know they would do the announcements like verbally if there were any verbals like hey we have a youth auction coming up hey we have uh we have a you know a carry-in after service uh today um hey we're going to be you know whatever whatever the case mm -hmm. would be um and then we would change it up from time to time. It wouldn't always be the same. So it just depends on your church's philosophy. And I think for me, um, I think we should be careful what we communicate and why. And I think kind of when I texted you yesterday, this conversation that we wanted to have today for today's episode, mm -hmm. um, I, I just, I'm making, we talked about transitions in last week's episode and I'm making this transition uh, yesterday was my last Sunday at, at the current church that I was working at. And the pastor made a statement when he got up there after the first worship song and he kind of did the announcements on the run through. Um, and he was like, you know, we wanted to let you know that, you know, we're sad that Micah and his wife or this is their last Sunday. And he stopped what he was saying. And he was like, you didn't change your mind. Did you? And I was like, what? I'm like, I'm up in the balcony. Like, running live stream and i'm like what why are you <laughs> what <laughs> and so yeah i just don't get it so um when i say communications it's it's a couple of different things right what we communicate how do we promote events social media within the church um utilizing your resources there and then what should be communicated and what should not be communicated. Like there are things where I'm like, I wouldn't dare say those things from the platform. Yeah. Um, it's just the sacred space. And um, yeah. How do you feel about that? Like, like I, I'm a, so let me just take it a step further. So like, I, like I've said, I've stated numerous times on this podcast that I've worked in mid to larger size churches. S some of the things that they do in smaller churches would never fly in big churches. Oh yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. Aunt Susie, who's 70 years old in the back, stands up and says, will you pray for my nephew's knee who got scraped in the parking lot of the church the other day because he fell off his bike? Yeah. We don't that this is something we don't do in big church. Yeah, big absolutely. Churches, right. Mm -hmm. Bigger and larger ministries, because if, if you did that, then everybody would have to do that. And we'd be there until Jesus came back because there'd be 500 people sharing prayer requests. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so. It and I Go think ahead. even with that, there's announcements like that, too, because there's been times where I have my announcements. And usually, especially with ministry teams, it's like, well, hey, if there's a special announcement, 
that needs to be made, please let, you know, please email it to our, you know, please email it to our, um, to our bulletin team so they can put it together um, or, you know, let Pastor Scott know so he can do the announcements or get, or get that responsibility to someone who's going to be sharing the announcements that Sunday. And sometimes there could be times where we're doing the announcements and then we're getting ready to go into service and someone goes, oh, by the way, the the women's group is doing a uh, is doing a like fundraiser. So please come out to that. We have information at the table out there. And it's like and then someone does that and then someone else will stand up and make an announcement. Sometimes you have like three people within the audience making announcements and it takes. 15, 20 minutes to get through the announcements. And, and and I think in some ways that's kind of in small churches, they don't see, well, there's no issue with that. But the problem is, is it just takes you out. Like when you, I mean, just doing announcements in a worship setting anyway, kind of can take someone out of that worship space, especially if you're sitting in there and there's music playing and you're preparing your heart for worship. And then you, you get ready and, you know, and usually a lot of times churches you get there and right when, you know, the band gets up there and the band will play like maybe the opening song or the first song to the service and welcome everybody. And then you go into announcements. So if you're going into a flow and I'm thinking about, you know, creating a spiritual flow space. So sometimes if you get up there and you're like, oh, yeah, and as a parishioner, you're up there, you're having a great time of worship. And I was like, OK, you may be seated. All right. And you sit there and you hear 20 minutes of announcements. It kind of just takes you out of it. Because now it's like, okay, there's this going on. There's this going on. There's this going on. You, here's how you give money to the church. Here's the different ways. And it's just. And, and that's how like, we, that's where video announcements can be very beneficial because if they're 90 oh, yeah. seconds and you have somebody who's polished and can and communicate those things with a staff member, volunteer, whoever, uh, if they're really good at that communications piece and you can edit those videos down to 90 seconds, that gives you more time for worship and more time for teaching. Well, even even if you have a even if you have like a teleprompter, like I know on my phone I have like a teleprompter software where it videotapes me and I can see something. Yep. So we used a teleprompter me, at both of my last churches. And even even if you have someone who may not be good at communicating, but they can read off a teleprompter and read very good and and kind of do all that like very easily. And I think that's a great thing too, because even during announcements, you can talk about stuff. And sometimes as you're explaining stuff, you can kind of get tongue tied or you're trying to remember like all the different announcements, especially if you don't have it written down and the announcements could just drag. But if you can do an announcement and you can get your five events that you want to talk about done within like 30, 45 seconds, and that's okay. And the great thing about video announcements is then you could throw it up on the website. You could throw it up on Facebook. If, you know, and just say, here's the announcements and it's the same video. And it just like goes through everything real quick. Mm -hmm. So it, I really struggle with that. Um, for, for somebody who's worked in larger situations, um, this last church that I set up, you know, I was kind of like an interim tech director for six months or whatever, a contracted worker and um, very much like, old school mindset, smaller church mentality. Uh, pastor preached yesterday and they did the response song. And at the end, right when they were saying, you know, if you want to follow us online, you can, you want to do this, you can, uh, if not have a great week. And before he could say, amen, you're dismissed. Somebody's like, pastor, I want to say something. And they were that, you know, we've already been there over an hour and it's like, uh, we got to go, we got to wrap this up. So, and two, you got to think 21st century, you got to think live stream. And if somebody's standing up and saying something, you're not going to be able to hear them because they don't have a microphone and you're not going to be able to see them because you're not going to be able to see them with the camera. Yeah. And so it, it makes super awkward moments on your live stream. So exactly. And, that's, and, that's, and, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's also kind of the big issue too, because we're, we're, we are in a different thing. And even, especially now, even though we do see people are starting to come back to in-person worship service, but there's other people who, you know, they still are not comfortable in coming back. Or you may have people who, let's say, you know, if I got COVID, I'm not coming in in-person service, so I'm going to have to watch service online. Or even if I just was out with the flu, at least I have the luxury where I can still be a part of worship service and watch it 
So then when there's someone's giving announcement from the floor, and if everything's and if the sound technician did a good job and everything's due where you have the clarity of sound, so you have to be mic'd, then all I'm watching is literally so the the band on stage doing blank stares at somebody in the audience for like five minutes, and you're like, what the heck is going on? And you don't know what's going on. Um you did bring up an interesting point, Mike. You talked about when people say, Well, I didn't hear that announcement or I didn't see that announcement. Um yeah, like I think when those comments get made, I think they fall into a couple of categories. First of all, if someone's expecting to see something on the website and it's not on the website, so that's why they didn't find out about it. Um, I think there's a there's a problem with that. And I think we could easily say, well, yeah, it needs to be on the website. All these announcements need to be on all the different social media platforms. At the same time, if it's a small church and more likely it's probably the pastor who is in charge of all those sites. Isn't like I was, priest? well, I was at, a, I went to, there's a buddy of mine who was at, who's a Presbyterian pastor. And I was going to, he asked me to kind of accept their, like attend church with him and just kind of assess everything and do like a, like kind of like a first time visitor assessment. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. So, and this is like February. So I go and it snowed, but it snowed Thursday, heavy snow, but everything's been plowed. I go, I look on the Facebook page. I look on the website page. I look on the Facebook page. I don't see anything. Looks like everything's good. Services still go. I drive to church. I park. I have to walk. And I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking over some snow mounds. I finally get to the church building and I pull on every single door to the church and it doesn't open. Mm. Well, they canceled service. And they called like the, and they put it on the news thing. And they also put it on their website, but they didn't put it on their Facebook page. So then I messaged the pastor. I'm like, Hey, I, I went to church today, but the doors were closed. Like, Oh shoot. Yeah. We closed the church. Like, yeah, I saw on Facebook goes, Oh, I forgot to put it on Facebook, which granted since I was doing an assessment it was fine. But if I was a first time visitor and I'm like, Oh, maybe this church is closed. Maybe they're not open anymore. Like, so there's stuff like that that can happen. So if people are complaining about that, it's like, well, yeah, if you know that someone's doing it, then maybe offer, hey, do you need help? Can I, you know, if you can I like put those type of things on Facebook? You know, like I think there's something where people can help out on that. I think the other time when people say they didn't hear about it, I think it's almost kind of an excuse. Because yeah. when when because if something happens and you missed out. It, either if you missed out because you didn't want to go or you missed out because you're too busy and you forgot about it and you say, oh, well, I didn't know. And that was always the big argument, especially when we would hear people say, oh, I didn't know about this event. And it's like, how do they not know? It was in the email. It was on. It was communicated verbally. It was in the bulletin. It was on the slides. It's been communicated multiple times for the last month. How do you not know? Mm -hmm. And I think it goes back to A. Because it's communicated so often, it just becomes white noise and you just forget about it because it's just constantly going around. Or two, people just don't want to participate in this event, but they don't want to say anything like, yeah, I don't want to participate in this. Or I think three, how the announcements are communicated. Like if it's someone who communicates and they ramble on and on. Then you're probably not gonna you probably missed everything because you're just hearing them talk about, oh yeah, there's gonna be this and this and this, and we should go to this because this is gonna be a great thing for our community and and we're gonna make a lot of change a lot of lives for Jesus Christ and everything else. It's like, yeah, but I missed but I missed what time this starts. I missed Yeah, I, I yeah. think yeah, I think that you know it's great, you're making a great point, but like I, and that's to to piggyback off of that, I think there's that's the hard balance too. Right. Like you, it's a struggle because you want to incorporate volunteers and you want to bring uh, fresh faces on stage and, you know, get more people plugged in and involved in various parts of the ministry of the church. But if they're not good public speakers, then maybe you don't want them on the platform. Or yeah. you can use the video announcement thing to your benefit. And then if you're pre recording those things and playing them live in a service, then it, it can make things 
uh, easier because you can pre-record and do a lot of stuff in post-production, right? Like so, yeah. uh, it's it's a it's a catch twenty two really in my opinion. Um, but if you really cast that vision starting from the top of the ministry and and really know um, what your you know your expectation is uh, each week, then you know, really hit those things that I talked about earlier, like giving small groups, um, social media, how you can follow us. Because when you, if you follow, if, if you get a following, it's a marketing strategy, right? If you, if you get a following and people are following you on different social platforms on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and et cetera, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The, the idea is that if they don't hear it in church, they'll see it online somehow. Right. And so, um, you know, if you, you're hitting those same topics every single week, mm -hmm. it's it's beneficial for your ministry. But at the same time, um, not making it so cringeworthy. I think it's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, like you, you you said it, Scott, with with people doing announcements and and other things where they're just not good at public speaking. Uh, so it can be it can be awkward and. I know from experience because I've led worship and I've preached and taught and done different things that like there are times when I'm not super comfortable being on stage, but if you put a guitar in my hand or a keyboard, mm -hmm. you know, in front of me, like I'm, I feel right at home, but that's just my culture of leading worship and the, the time and the effort that I put in over the years to do that. It, it doesn't make it easier, but then, then you have the people that are like super awkward and I know if I'm going to a church and somebody, you know, like you're saying, Scott got up and they did announcements and it's not very uh, conducive and they're, they're fumbling all over their words and they're, they're not very good at communicating their thoughts or communicating what they're supposed to communicate while they're up there. It, for me, it's super awkward and I, and my heart breaks for them and it's, it's cringy and I'm like, oh my gosh, can we just, I, I want to help them. Right. I want to do, <laughs> do everything in that moment to help yeah. them because they're struggling and I just, I can't imagine what people were thinking in the audience, plus people that may be watching online. But yeah, that's, the, that's but that's oh, also yeah. the that's also I'm sorry, that's also the difference between smaller churches and larger churches. The expectation, right? Yeah. Like you're not gonna in a larger situation, you're not gonna just put somebody out there that's randomly gonna fumble over their words and not get the point across that they're trying to get across. And and I've been and I've had moments like that where someone's been communicating an announcement from the floor, and this is like pre-COVID and. I can remember like they'd be, you know, they're struggling and you can tell they're struggling and, and you could just tell like everyone's just kind of sitting there and they're just kind of being polite, but they're just like, okay, wrap it up. So then once, once that person's done with their like 15 minute spiel, I go, all right. So, and then as I felt like for me as a leader to kind of get people to know about this event, I almost had to say, okay, yeah, men's breakfast next Saturday, 10 a.m., be there. And then it was just like, boom, boom, boom. Like I'm going to hit the key points of that. You know, what do you feel? Speaker. How do you feel about, <laughs> how do you feel about um, how things look like as far as graphics, as far as what you're promoting, um, creating a culture of branding and, and marketing and keeping everything within your brand. How do you feel about those things? Like, uh, in respect to the church and and not getting super like it's not a political thing it's not a yeah. it's just a marketing strategy how yeah. do you feel about I, that I, in the church yeah so as far I, I guess are you talking about just branding as in form of communicating the problem well, we're talking or... about we're talking about communications we're talking about social media we're talking about yeah. how people do announcements and stuff in churches like mm -hmm. i you know i've been asked to go share at churches or lead worship at churches and i walk into a church and i pick up their bulletin and i'm like I saw this five loaves, uh, you know, five, you know, five fish and two loaves of bread graphic when I was five years old, right? That was thirty years ago. Yeah. Why? Why is it yeah. still on a bulletin? Why? So, why are yeah. bulletins still a thing? Like, <laughs> I see well, some of those graphics and I'm like, this is super cringe looking. Like, it's yeah. It's, how do you feel? Like, the last two churches I worked at, we had colors, we had fonts, we had a brand. Right. We tried to establish the brand and incorporate that brand in everything we did. Sermon series, um, the colors, the 
you know, if you, you, you just said it a minute ago, um, when we, you said men's pan, pancake breakfast, right? Mm-hmm. Let's say Scott, you're pastoring the church and you're having a men's pancake breakfast. You're not going to have like the cartoony looking little pancakes with butter and syrup on them. You're going to have like a legit modern. Are looking... you? Are well, you? <laughs> I'm not. That that if I'm pastoring a church, that's not happening, right? Just because of my graphics and the marketing background that I have, like you're going to want to make things look a little bit more modern, and that that goes back to the attention to detail when you want to recruit volunteers when you want to. When, when guests are coming in your church and you want it to look like you're taking ministry seriously, you're not going to do something like, and in their world of minds, like they think it's great. But for me, I'm like, this is cringy. Why would you do this? Well, this is- and to be fair for smaller churches, they probably have a computer system that has windows 95 and they're using just the, the random clip art from Microsoft word. <laughs> and they probably, and they probably think it's the greatest thing ever. Well, they probably think that they're probably, I think, I don't think it's the greatest thing ever. I think they say, wow, we're so blessed that we have a computer that we can actually make flyers. Well, I mean, I think, I think that's how, like, I think that's how small churches think. They don't feel like I'm playing devil's advocate here. Well, you are. And I, and I get that. And I think for me personally, I think branding is important in how something looks because if something looks very dated it's going to, I mean, that's, the, I think that's the one reason why a lot of churches kind of like rechange their sanctuaries. Mm-hmm. So it's not, so, you know, it looks more of like an industrial feel. Or it looks more of a corporate feel than like grandma's living room with the red plushy carpet mm-hmm. and the big wood paneling everywhere. Like it's not I think 1974 that, anymore. Exactly. So even, but even if you have a church aesthetic that still looks like it's 1974, or especially, you know, think about the Catholic churches, some of those churches were built in the 1800s and you go in there and it's all stone and Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, you can't really like, you know, get some, I mean, I guess you could get some spray paint and put Jesus in a cool, like awesome style, Banksy style, but. I think you're going to make somebody mad. But you're going to make someone mad and B, it's probably going to look tacky in the midst of an 18th century architecture. So yeah. even simple like bulletins, and I know like who still has bulletins. I know a lot of them are getting rid of bulletins. Some of them are. Or they've rebranded doing, it or and called or it re-branded something else. It. Or they just have them on an app. You you you, you trade the bulletin for an app now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's... I would say, and oh, I was, and I would say with the bulletin, like I remember one bulletin we had, you know, and bulletins are expensive too. Like the church that I, the church that I recently pastored at, we would get stuff from Warner Press, which is from the Church of God. It's kind of like a big publishing company, and we would always pay. And I think it was like almost like a hundred bucks just for like three months or four months of of bulletins, which is nice because you have this nice printed cover. But still, you have a nice printed cover, but that even still looks kind of dated. In some ways, it looks professional, but it looks dated. But then you type everything on there, and literally the bulletin had not only different types of font, but it was different sizes too. And then even the note taking for the pastor, like sermon notes, was literally a clip art of a notepad that was probably about, I don't know, like the size of a wallet, not very big. And it's like, man, if people want to take notes, they're pretty much going to be writing in the margins and writing all over the announcements that are underneath that because you only gave them a tiny square to put notes in. And then when we changed it, when when my wife changed it, I mean, she got blasted for it, even though she went through proper channels, even though she went to her team and said, hey, I like to make changes. They said, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. We support any changes you make. We support you. And then I go and says here's what i want to do i said okay that looks great we went to go print and man some people liked it because they thought oh it looked cleaner and there was more like sermon notes and other people absolutely hated it because it was a change mm-hmm. Which, and, yeah. and it, it was and it was this divisive and it's like a bulletin shouldn't be divisive but it is. And I mean, and, and it's, and it's, I think even like with video announcements, I think sometimes I saw a video announcement at the church that I'm attending here, very clean, but then sometimes, you know, they may throw like a little like comedy in there, like, 
uh, like, and I, I don't know, like someone's talking about some type of missions trip that was going in and you just see them sitting there and you can see the backgrounds like blurred out. So they have a good focus on the subject. Well, then you see somebody walk in the background. It's still blurred, but it looks like they're wearing a deep diving uniform and they go sit in a chair and they're reading a book and then they get up and leave. Mm-hmm. It's just this little tiny thing and people are laughing, which, okay, you know, it's a good time. It's fun, you know, because sometimes announcements are boring. So it's good. I mean, I don't know if anyone got any slack for that, but I'm sure someone would be like, oh, that that why, why'd you put a deep cyber there? What did that have to do with? We're talking about missionaries and our youth going on missions, and now we just have someone randomly walking in a costume sitting in the back that you could barely see. It's all blurred out. But it's stuff like that where I go, what's why are we getting upset about something like that? Something so stupid. Or like... Did you? I don't know if you saw the video where the girl, it was some random church. I saw it circulating recently where someone was um, talking about, oh, hey, we're doing this fundraiser. We're going to send Bibles to Ukraine. And then she says, the church in Ukraine is blowing up. And this is a verbal announcement. And then she caught herself and she goes, oh. <laughs> Which is probably why it's better to have video announced because obviously the editor sees that goes, yeah, we got to reshoot this. <laughs> we got to do a second take of this because no, you can't say the church in Ukraine's blowing up, especially with the current culture and climate that's going on over there. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> what's the weirdest thing? That, what's the weirdest thing you experienced today? That was my weirdest thing. <laughs> yes. Or are you telling me that? <laughs> but yeah, so going back to communication, like I think branding is important. And I mean, sometimes branding can get gimmicky. Like if everything has to be in like your church's colors or everything has to have like the church's watermark on it. I mean, it's like, yeah, you don't really need to go to an extreme with that. But I mean, if it's something that's clear cut and you're trying to make things look clean and polished and make sure that you want it to look professional, because if someone's coming in for the first time at the church and they see something that looks professional and clean and something that doesn't look like it came out of a cartoon or something out of Who Framed Roger Rabbit's Toon Lane, Toontown, then yeah, yeah, I think it'd be great. I mean, if you're using Comic Sans for everything, you might want to change your text. Yeah, I would totally agree. I but. I'm on the other other side of that where I'm the one making graphics and I'm the one putting the watermarks um, on everything. <laughs> no, I mean, yes and no, but uh, it's, I think it's necessary uh, to create that culture because like, I, I'll be the first one to tell you, but, you know, when my wife and I look at a church for the first time, the first thing we do is go look at their website. We look and see if they have an app. We look at their live stream to see what they look like. And then if we go to visit that church, see if that stuff matches up with what they're doing online because we live in 2022 where things are uh, very much online. And that was even before COVID, right? Like Mm -hmm. you wanted to see what churches look like before even stepping foot in them. And that, that gave you a a chance to experience them before experience them in person, experiencing them in person. So like, uh, I think it's beneficial to have a good online product, a good brand, a good social media campaign um, and promoting you know, what you're doing at your church. Like, how are, how are people supposed to know? I mean, the days of just going to a church and visiting are over. Like, you just, you. I mean, I don't know if you would do this, Scott, but would you just go to some random church without looking at anything they did? Or would you check out their social first? Would you check out their website first? Well, I would have to check, I would check out their website or social first because I have to know what time does their service start. Mm-hmm. And then if I find, so then if I go to the site, then obviously if I find that information, then I'm going to be like, okay, well, it has ministries. What ministries do they have? Like even, even when I'm in the process, even when I was in the process of looking at churches to pastor at when I was in the my transitional phase, I mean, I was looking at websites and I'm kind of like, oh, and, and sometimes I remember like the church it got now, I said, oh yeah, I was looking at stuff on your website. And and literally the pastor said, oh, please don't look at our website. It it definitely needs an overhaul. And we're, we're having someone like really reworking. We're going to be launching a new site soon because it's so dated. It's like, okay, that's good. And I guess I kind of understand the point, like we want to work on our website, 
but we also don't want to take it down because people do go there for information. So you don't want to put like, shut it down and put okay, or put a blurb like, hey, we're under construction and just even put like, here's our service times, check out our Facebook for more information. And then just kind of wait until your website actually is up to snuff. Like you can kind of do that instead of keeping something, a website that looks like it was made in GeoCities. Well, the church that I just have transitioned out of their website, I think I shared this a couple of weeks ago, but they they hadn't been maintaining their website and nobody had used or done anything to their website in over three years. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I created a new website on the back end using a different server, different host, all those things created it. I didn't shut the old one down until the new one was live. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we directed folks to the new one. Um, and then we canceled the old one and got rid of the old one. Yeah. And I think that's the hard. Yeah. And I think that's the hard thing with, especially when you talk about ch medium sized churches versus small churches versus large churches is sometimes small churches, they want a good website. So they use like a square or a, or a Wix, which are very easy to design. And it's very easy just to like click they and were, drag without the, code. The, yeah, the interfaces are really conducive. And yeah. But if you still don't know what you're doing and how to put things together and how things connect to things, then it can still look very bad too. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And I that's think cool. that's where, and I think that's where kind of like when churches talk about, well, we need help. So you have to hire you have to outsource it to someone else or hire someone to do it for you. And sometimes it's like the money that someone would charge for that mm -hmm. to just even create it, update it, clean it up, or at least be able to make it so that, okay, here's what it looks like. And then you can kind of easily make some changes. And if someone who could just do maintenance on it, then that's good. But still the price for that, it's like, we don't want to pay that type of money. And I get that. And I understand that, especially if you're on a budget, so you just have volunteers try to do it, and it's hard because they don't necessarily have the code or the thing to be able to do it. And I think sometimes that's – or the person – or, you know, they called a former pastor who was a tech person and said, hey, we're having problems with this. Can you help us? And then they have to, like, direct them, like, oh, yeah, here's here's how you do this. Here's how you take this off. Here's how you do that, and then kind of do it that way. But, yeah, it's – I mean, I think communication is hard enough because, you know, people don't like talking in front of people or sometimes people who want to try to do stuff with even just putting like a image in a, in a something on Facebook. Sometimes those can look pretty bad or dated too. like um, when my parents were trying to find their pastor, they would every Sunday they'd have this like congregational call to prayer and they had this image that was created look good and then they have a bible verse and then they would have something for the prayer focus and i remember the person who they hired as their communications person jc's like oh please pray for the man that god will that god will bring to this church to be our pastor well there's a problem with that first problem is is this church it's a church of god church so they affirm both men and women as pastors and the person who is creating this stuff comes from a church background where women are not allowed to be pastors so instinctively they put men and someone caught it and they said hey you need to, you need to change this because we affirm both men and women pastors and luckily they said oh and then all the other times they would always put men or a man or woman to be our pastor and all the different ones but the first one it was like i saw even i saw it and i was like <gasps> like i cringed <laughs> i had a full-on cringe like <gasps> what and then, so then finally, but luckily, you know, the the executive pastor caught it and contacted him like, hey, we need to change. And actually, I think he went and changed it and then said, hey, when you put this stuff, you got to put man and woman because we do affirm women to be ministers. So we don't want to. And again, like if there's a woman pastor who goes, hey, I want I might be I might put my chips in to go to this church. And then they see that saying, oh, the man. Well, uh, I'm not going to submit my stuff anymore because obviously they, they want a male pastor. Yeah, they want a male pastor because they're looking for a man to lead the church. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just such a wild thing, right? Where, um, yeah, you just have to be careful. And, and but I shared this in other episodes where I've done coaching and consulting with churches where I've went in and 
they're like, you know, what would you charge to fix our website or what would you charge to make us some graphics or what would you charge to help us and train our folks? Like, and I am not, I'm, I'm like, my goal and my perspective is to make, um, make their lives easier and train their people and not break the bank at the same time. Because I know, yeah. cause I've, I've worked with consulting companies who have come into the churches that I've worked at and I'm like, are you kidding me? Our, our church ain't never going to be able to afford this. Like you're out of your mind. I remember we, at one time, Scott, we were, I was at a church and we were, we had a consulting company come in and they had, they gave us a quote on like what it would be like to have a new soundboard, lighting board, um, new speakers for front of house, like basically, you know, revamp the entire experience when you walk in from sound video lighting. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they, they looked at us and they told us to expect fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars per seat. So, like, if you per had a church, seat per seat, so like, if you had a church of six hundred people, and prior to COVID, you know, we were running six to eight hundred, and so like, let's just say seven hundred times two thousand, you're looking at that's one point four million dollars, and just sound lighting and video. That's where would all that money come from? Like, why that much? Right. Well, I mean, I've been, I mean, I worked in a theater at Anderson and we would have, I mean, granted we had our lights and stuff, but sometimes we'd have to order some special lights for a show or we'd have to order more like lighting gels for, you know, our ERSs and our Fresnels. Well, that, and it's just, it's, it's, it's that, that mindset of like, they think that you, the church just has money to blow which they don't in most cases. So Well, especially if you have a church of 600, I think, okay, we're going to, like even like when projectors were first coming out on the market. And I mean, now I can remember, now you can get a projector for story. cheap, but before they're like, if you if you consult this, they like, okay, you need this type of projector because again, you have these lights and you have these, so you need a projector that can really has like a strong amount of lumens in it and it's going to cost you two grand per projector. And I'm thinking, yikes. Two Scott, grand want, for a brick. Scott, <laughs> brick you don't want to know how much. Scott, you don't want to know how much the projector cost at the last church I worked at. It was probably, it was one of it was one of the ones that were like it was like the laser ones that threw across the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was not. Did, did it do like the whole um? What are they called? Um, the wide splashes where it's like it goes across the whole entire stage. Like you seen those? I forget yeah. what the technical name. I forget the technical name. Yeah, I I got so mad at that church for, for various reasons, but for goodness. because they had they had they got this new fancy ladies or projector, and I'm like, we're talking a substantial amount of money, and um, the old projector. I think they had two projectors, like one on each side back in the day, one that was shoot on each side of the room, and they were just sitting there on the floor, not being used. And I'm like, there are churches all over the place that would be so fortunate to have this, and you're just letting us sit here. And I don't, I don't get that. And but, that, that's a, that's a topic for another day of churches hoarding stuff. We may, that'll be another episode. Why do churches hoard their stuff, <laughs> especially um, their dated stuff? <laughs> yes. Uh, do you? I think you know as we're kind of wrapping up our conversation about communications. Mm -hmm. I think we can say. There's two types of communications, right? Communications being the social media bubble that you're posting on website, mm -hmm. your your live stream, your um, your website app, if you have one of those, and then like what you're communicating as the pastor um, who's casting vision for the church. Um, we've kind of covered the social media piece and the branding piece. How do you feel like, and I asked you this a little bit ago when we started, but like uh, as the pastor, what should be communicated and what shouldn't be communicated? How do you feel about that? Like, uh, are are think, you in the are you in the camp of like should we over communicate uh, certain things or should we just communicate and be very I guess generic in our delivery because we're we're not um, not everybody needs to know everything right so well I think I think my approach I think my approach has changed before I felt like you know if I can communicate it's more of like if I'm on a Sunday and I'm communicating something I want to communicate as much information as possible so people understand what it is what the vision is and why we're doing it right mm -hmm. at the same time 
I feel like that doesn't necessarily work. What I find that works better is I can say, hey, here's this, here's this thing that's happening. Here's the time it's starting. Here it is. If you have more questions about it, please speak to me. And then after that, then if people have like piqued their interest, they may talk to me. Or if there's someone where I'm like, hey, I think that this would be a great class for them to be in. Then me as a pastor, I will go and I'll talk to him. I said, hey, you know, we made this announcement about this new uh, study that we're doing. I think I think this might be very beneficial. And especially if I have a relationship with them and I kind of know a little bit about what's going on in their lives. I'm like, I think this would be very beneficial for you. Do, would you would you take this class? If they said, oh, no, I'm not interested. I'm like, well, you know, why are you not interested? And then that way I kind of understand why someone may not be interested in it. And if it's like, well, it's the timing or if it's the day or the time or anything else, then it's like, OK, if we were to offer this again and you do, you st- if we were to offer it during those times, that would fit. Would you be interested? Yes. OK, so next time around, I may offer it on a different day. And at least if people may be like, no, nah, I don't want to, but at least I'm getting more information. I'm kind of getting more personal feedback from why people people who do want to participate and even people who don't want to participate, at least I'm still building those relationships and saying, okay, but I'm not doing, but I can't do that if I'm just communicating everything up front. Cause then at the end it's like, okay, I gave all the information. Now I'm going to go and do my own thing. And I don't know what people are thinking or people are even interested. Like I just, because at that point it's like, well, I gave them all the information they needed to know. If they show up, if they show up, if they don't show up, then they don't show up. And then we sit in meetings and we go, well, the reason why they didn't show up, I think it's because of this. Like, well, you think, but you don't know because you didn't talk to them. Yeah. Interesting. Are there things that you shouldn't say? Yeah. Like, well, I guess what I mean by that is just that, you know, like yesterday, for example, I was telling you that the pastor said, did you change your mind? Like, yeah. what if that, would, that what if that would have been a rough transition? For, for that person. Oh yeah. And I can say this cause this is what I, what I was living through in the moment, but you know, I don't know that I would have, I don't know that I would have said that. Cause like, if it was like, if it was rough for the person leaving or the pastor or the staff or anything like that, um, you know, that's a cringy moment. And I don't know that I would have done that. Yeah. Or even if it's, or even if it's like, if the body doesn't know that there is like a bunch of like turmoil in those meetings when someone decided they were going to leave or, or maybe the person isn't, even though the person said, Oh yeah, I'm resigning, I'm leaving bye," but you really find out it's like either you leave or we're going to vote on it at a budget, like at a business meeting. So it was very like do or die kind of a thing. Then if you made that joke, if you made that, then it's going to be a hurtful and please, you're kind of making a very distasteful joke at someone's expense who's already had a terrible time in this ministry in this transition. They probably didn't want to leave, but now you're going like, Oh, are you sure you don't want to leave? It's like, what are they going to say? Well, if I stayed, you're going to fire me anyway. <laughs> like, what would you say? Like, it's just kind of been awkward. And even, even though it was on good terms or bad terms, just that comment is awkward and it's cringy and it, and it doesn't even made, and especially if you're up there making jokes and people are like making all these other like side comments. Well, that's just small. It just mentality. it just extends the time of the announcements, and then people are hearing all this banter, and they're not getting the facts of what this announ- what this thing is, when does it start, and why do I need to be there? Mm-hmm. So I think it's always the who, what, when, where, and why, like. If you can hit those five things, or at least just stick to those within those five parameters, then you're going to have clean, clear-cut announcements. And then any more information, if someone's interested, they could send you an email. They could talk to you after church, and you can do that. Or even if you go, hey, here's this thing. If you have any questions right after service, I'm just going to sit out in the lobby for 10 minutes for anybody who has any questions. Yeah. And then and, you know, I sit there, and I'll talk to people, and... And, you know, if, if even if people are just coming and talk to me about, you know, Green Bay Packers or Cleveland Browns football, cool. But then it's like, but then at least I can say, oh, were you interested in taking the class and then kind of get their perspective, too? So even though I may be just, you know, shooting a breeze, I can still take that moment to build those relationships and kind of go, hey, 
did you have any questions about this new like Bible study series that we're doing? Yeah, I mean, I just feel like there's a time and a place for all those mm -hmm. things. And uh, you just have to be careful and mindful. Um, just, you know, from all aspects of that, just because, uh, I don't know, you just never know who's going to be listening. You never know who's going to be watching, you know, and if you're so... Um, this is going to sound horrible coming out of my mouth, but if you're so like um, consumed with yourself as a ministry and you just want to do things the way that you've been doing them and forget that you're there to win souls for the kingdom of God. And that can include your live stream. That can include stuff you're posting on social media. That can include events that you're hosting and, and, you know, things that are going on outside of your corporate worship setting. And if, if the only chance for people to see your ministry is via communications through a live stream or via a podcast or a Facebook live session that you're doing or a back to school event that you're hosting outside of corporate worship, then you just have to be mindful of that, right? Like you just can't, um, can't continue to do things uh, the way that you've been doing them without fear or repercussion of of change because change is inevitable. So I don't know. I feel like I'm ranting, but it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's very important, right? Like if you churches are in decline, I think you, Scott, you told me the stat, but like 85 to 95% of churches are in decline in the United States because of just the stuff that they've been doing for the same 50 years. Um, and then they wonder why their churches are dying. Well, Change the way that you do things. Reinvent the wheel. Or or I think a lot of times, especially within small churches, you know, we hear about, well, it's all about Jesus and it's about the proclaiming the gospel. So who cares if our church looks outdated? Who cares if there's stains on the carpet, on this 25-year-old carpet? Who cares if, um, you know, we have a Microsoft Office clip art for sermon notes notepad for sermon notes that are in the bulletin like who cares and it's like well it it does i mean yeah in the grand scheme of things for if, if we look at eternity that stuff doesn't matter but at the same time you don't want that stuff to kind of be a barrier for people to be able to walk through the doors if they feel like oh because again you could have a great contemporary service you could have a great pastor that can really preach the word of god very effectively but the moment they walk in and they see i just walked back and i walked went through a time machine i walked back into the 1960s and you're going in and all you're seeing is like and again you know a lot sometimes a lot of younger families you know they show up towards the like right at the beginning or sometimes five minutes after service starts so if you walk in and you just see the committed like older folks church members there and you're thinking okay here i am a family man in my mid thirties with my kid and my wife. And we just walked into my grandparents' church and you'd kind of, and already, and even though everything else could be great and everything else is modern, just that first initial impression starts to kind of pave on your entire experience there from the end. And maybe at the end you might be like, okay, you know, it's, it's an older church, but, they're kind of moving in the right direction and go, well, everything's good, but they, what they're doing in worship service doesn't necessarily fit with the culture that is precedented there, both mm -hmm. there or even in their social media. So it's almost like, it's, so it's almost like a tug of war match. And then, you know, mm -hmm. I think when people want to go to a church, they want to be able to come in. They want to be able to have this time of worship. They want it to be as smooth as possible. And then so when you get so when you go in there and you're having this tug of war match and you're kind of psyching yourself out like oh is this like an all hymns church is this a contemporary church it said contemporary on their website but it definitely does not look contemporary or modern mm -hmm. um, from the building I went in then it does cause a struggle. Well, and then too, like you know, not to get too off topic, but do you like with the advantage of having live streaming these days and like. Scott, say a church reaches out to you or reaches out to me and 
they're like, hey, we would love you to pray about coming and being a part of our staff. That happened to me a couple of months ago. Uh, there was a church in Missouri that reached out and asked me if I'd be their senior pastor or consider praying about that. And the first thing I did was look at their website. They don't have one. Looked at their Facebook. They don't have one. No, I'm sorry. They have a Facebook. They didn't have a website. But I got on their Facebook and I look at their live stream and their live stream is super cringy. And I'm like, there's no way. There's absolutely no way that I would consider that. Yeah. But it's a, it's a culture and it's a mindset. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, and I think even on the same side, I think for pastors who are at small churches, because every church you go to now, they want a live video. They want to see you preach. And I mean, you could send them like an audio thing, but they're always going to ask, well, do you have a video? Do you have a video? And I mean, now that's going to probably be the more foundational now. So, I mean, if I'm at a church that, you know, if I was pastoring a church that was, you know, an older congregation that didn't have good technology, that had a cringy live stream, and that's the video I send them. I think that team who's probably like, you know, out of 500 church, are going to see that and they're going to be like, oh, no. And not because the preaching's bad, but they're going to look at the presentation and they're going to make a judgment on that. And I think sometimes that can happen too. Um, so it's almost like, you know, how do I, so there's, there've been a couple of times where I've sent messages or I've sent stuff when we had COVID because we're doing our family life center that looked more modern than our sanctuary mm-hmm. because it looked better. And I mean, at that point I was using my computer that had a better presentation software than the other computer did. So I was able to have a nice cleaner polish and, and kind of set it up so the sound level is pretty good. But yeah, like that's always going to be a factor. And I think it's going to be very frustrating for some pastors who want to transition and they have no coming out of churches that don't have a good live. So they're going to have to like record themselves. And then I think sometimes that's going to be awkward because most, most people don't know how to preach to a camera. Yeah. Cause they never have. Cause they never have. And then it's like, you know, there's a certain way you have to do things and it's like, and I'm used to being on stage. So, and even like with cameras, like I don't necessarily know where cameras are, but now I'm starting to think like, okay, here's this camera and what's my good side, you know? And people think, well, that's weird. What do you mean what your good side is? Well, you have to start thinking about that stuff now. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes that pressure could go, can send people into a fizzy, like, well, am I even cut out for ministry? Cause I love to preach the word of God, but I have no clue on the technical side of things. Yeah. Or how to or how to have good stage presence. Like that's gonna be a whole different and I think that's gonna probably push that's probably gonna push people where some people are gonna be stuck in these, you know, some people are gonna get stuck in ministry because they can't seem to excel or grow like other pastors have in the past, where they maybe started small and then they got to a larger church. It's like, well, because the larger churches aren't gonna look for you because you don't have a good stage presence, you don't have you're, you're not preaching to the camera. You're kind of looking all over the place. You don't know where to lock your eyes to. And I think that's kind of a big, important thing that everybody has to really focus on. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening. And I would like to hear your points. Like, how's your church handling the your, your communication? Do you think you're doing it well? Do you think you're doing it poorly? Do you have any cringeworthy stories you'd like to share? We would like to hear them. Feel free to send us a message either on the Scott Stebbin Podcast Facebook group or you can go to the website, thescottstebbin.com, and send us an email or put something in the comments, and we'd love to hear your stories. But, guys, thank you so much for listening to us. I hope you have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you guys later. Mm